for hosting me and for the invitation. I'm extremely good, grateful for their support. I'm also grateful that uh, they have such a great group working to preserve uh, Sephardic traditions and Sephardic history and to spread the word. I also want a special thanks to my friend Judy Rodriguez, a great British artist who was the first person to tell me about the Sephardic Genealogical Society and your site. So thanks to Judy, who might be with us this evening. Now, uh, and of course, thanks for everybody for participating. Good to see you from here in the north of Portugal. Um, I'd like to start by talking about a moral issue that we tend to forget, but that to me is essential and that has been extremely important in my writing. And the moral issue that we tend to forget is the right to exist. And I realize that may sound strange, but I want to mention that before the 1960s and the 1970s of the last century, almost all historical texts, uh, you know, and school manuals were, were written from the point of view of the people who won all the battles and won all the wars. Um, in fact, all of them were written, virtually all of them were written to favor the political goals of dictators, presidents, prime ministers, governments. Um, since I live in Portugal, I tend to use examples from here, but I'd like to use one from the country where I was born, the United States. Uh, later, I'll be referring to, to Portugal, but I think it's important to recognize that excluding people from official history happens in every country. Now, I grew up in the state of New York, which is just, uh, just outside of New York City. And as you're probably aware, immigrants from Europe started arriving there in the 17th century. And they came from Holland and they came from England and they came later from Germany and other countries. And for a time, they lived peaceful with the Native Americans, the people we used to call Indians. But slowly they began to push the Native Americans off their land further and further and further away. And in New York, where I grew up, there were, for instance, two very well-known tribes, the Iroquois and the Mohawk. Perhaps you've heard of them. And... But how much time did we in the New York suburbs spend talking about Native American history and traditions and culture and music and art? Would you be surprised to learn that I don't think we spent more than a couple hours of my entire school growth talking about Native Americans? It wasn't until I went out west to Arizona, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, that I started really to learn anything about Native American culture and the Native Americans who do in fact still populate the United States. We also had the worst possible images in the movies of John Wayne. Uh, you may remember those uh, where the Indians were always the enemy, savages, brutal, horrible people, barely speaking English. Uh, I tend to call them Hollywood Indians because they weren't really Native Americans. Um, because you see, Native Americans to Hollywood and to most of America simply did not exist. Um, and maybe that's even the case in, in American schools today. I really don't know. I hope not. Now, without the right to exist, you simply vanish. Your story, how you lived, what you thought about, what you desired and feared never gets told. And so this becomes a moral issue, at least to me. Do all living beings have the right to exist because making someone invisible seems to me a crime against humanity. Indeed, is there any condition worse than simply not existing? Um, this profound truth, how people disappear from history, how people disappear from official histories became an important part of my life when I was researching my first novel, which was already mentioned here, The Last Kabbalist of Lisbon. So I want to talk about what this little book taught me about human rights and how it helped me what, to understand what I wanted to do with my writing and in my life. Now, um, the book was originally published in Portugal in 1996, though I wrote it in English. And I had the idea for the book probably around 1989. I remember I was in my parents' house. My mother was a great reader, so I lived in a kind of library. And in the room where she kept her art books and her biographies of the Bloomsbury group, she was very into the Bloomsbury group, but in the area where she kept her art books, I found a, a huge volume about Hebrew manuscript illumination. Now I was raised Jewish, but I was raised in a secular household. 
Uh, we can talk a little bit about that if you want. So I knew nothing about this tradition of Jewish manuscript illumination. So I picked up the book and I found the most amazing illustrations of Old Testaments and prayer books and Mishnah Torahs and other, other sacred literature. And uh, some of the drawings were actually a bit strange. Um, for instance, parrot-headed men and women. Now, I knew nothing about this tradition. I didn't quite realize yet that there were illustrations from Jewish, Jewish lore and Jewish mythology. And I noticed right away that some of the illuminations were from Lisbon. Now, that excited me because I'd already been to Portugal Lisbon and other cities to visit my father-in-law. I'm married to a Portuguese scientist. Uh, we've been together for 44 years. So I got pretty excited because Lisbon, manuscript illumination, Judaism, all these things resonated with me. And no one, although I'd been to Portugal to visit my father-in-law, no one had ever told me anything about Jewish manuscript illumination or anything about Jewish communities living in Portugal. So um, I decided to write a book. The first idea for my novel was a book about a Jewish manuscript illuminator living in Lisbon, probably in the 15th or 16th century. I didn't know yet. Pretty soon I found out about the Inquisition and I realized it would have to be before all the Jews were converted and then persecuted by the Inquisition. And while I was doing the research for this proposed book that I was going to write, I discovered the Lisbon Massacre of 1506. Now, what is the Lisbon Massacre of 1506? To explain a little bit about it, I need to go a little further back to 1496 and 1497. In 1496, the King of Portugal, King Manuel, issued an edict of expulsion for the Jews, just like uh, Ferdinand and Isabella had done four years earlier in Spain. Now, why did he want to get rid of the Jews from Portugal? He wanted to because he cut a deal with the Catholic monarchs of Spain, with Ferdinand and Isabella. They said, you can have the hand of our daughter in marriage. In other words, inherit all of Spain someday, but you have to kick out the Jews because they were the great ethnic cleansers of their day. And so he cut a deal. King Manuel cut a deal with the Spanish monarchs to kick out the Jews, but it didn't happen. He gave the Portuguese Jews 10 months to collect their belongings, sell their assets, get their lives together, and then leave. But three months later, in March of 1497, he invited the Jews to the ports, to Lisbon, Porto, Faro. And he said, look, I'm gonna have ships waiting for you and you can leave easily. But he tricked them. King Manuel tricked the Jews. He closed the ports and he had them all rounded up and forcibly baptized. Historians tell us that 20,000 Portuguese Jews were rounded up in Lisbon and baptized in a palace that borders what is still the main square in Lisbon, the Rocio. If you come to Lisbon, you will see the Rocio, which is still the main square. Now, when I discovered this, I started to do more research and I discovered that nine years later, in April of 1506, 2,000 of these converted Jews, who are called new Christians in Portugal, as opposed to old Christian, 2,000 of these converted Jews were murdered in a pogrom and burnt in two pyres in front of the Do St. Dominic's Church, in front of the St. Dominic's Church, because that was where the riot broke out. Now, we can talk a little bit more about why this particular pogrom happened at this time in April of 1506, if you want. Uh, it has to do with the plague. It has to do with the drought. People were a bit crazed. And Dominican priests ran throughout the city saying, death to the Jews, death to the heretics. And that's what happened. 2,000 converted Jews were murdered. Now, how many Jews were living? In, I should say 2,000 new Christians. They were converted. How many new Christians were living in Lisbon at the time? Somewhere between five, six, seven thousand. So you... So probably something like a third of the Jews, again, I apologize, a third of the new Christians were, were killed and burnt in the main square. So every family would have lost a father, mother, cousin, sister, aunt, uncle, or child, even worse. 
Um, now, when I learned about this massacre, uh, I asked all my friends, um, architects, uh, tenure professors, doctors, lawyers, well, what do you know about the Lisbon massacre? And all of them said to me, what massacre? What are you talking about? This massacre had been erased from Portuguese history. It hadn't been taught in the schools. It hadn't been taught in official history books. Now, I have an extremely subversive personality for better or for worse. So when I discovered that these 2000 murdered new Christians had been completely forgotten here in their own country, I was just, I grew outraged. And I decided that they, I would make this massacre the context for my novel about my manuscript illuminator. Um, and so I had to do a lot more research about the massacre and about Portuguese Jewish history. And um, I discovered that if you take on a project that doesn't have to do with official history, that is subversive, that defies history, you can get in trouble. You can be accused of treason. You can be accused of uh, disobeying the rules of the game and everything else. Um, you know, people resent you for talking about matters that are considered taboo or they just think that you're crazy. They say you're insane, it didn't happen, they lie, false news. Um, you also get, you, you also can't expect to make that much money because uh, writing official histories isn't the greatest way to make a living. Unofficial history isn't the greatest way to make, make a living. So it's a, re, it's a risk. It took me one entire year to research the book. It took me two years to write it, three years of my life. And then my agent in New York started to send the book around, hoping to find a publisher. After two years, 24 publishers had turned my novel down. No one wanted to publish it. They all said, this is a great novel. It's thrilling, it's moving, and it's based on true events, but it ain't gonna sell. Because those of you who know America realize that Americans have a geographical problem. We think that the world begins in Maine and Florida, and ends in California. So Lisbon in 1506 was completely off the radar of American literary editors. Well, I was extremely depressed because this was five years of my life and I had nothing. And so I had a crazy idea, which is proof that crazy ideas can sometimes save us, which is why not show the manuscript written in English to a Portuguese publisher? But I didn't know anything about Portuguese publishing. I didn't even know if they read books in English. I was very naive. And so I got the names of publishers from two friends. And there was one name on both lists, Maria de Piedad Ferreira. And so I called up Maria de Piedad. And in my pidgin Portuguese, I spoke Portuguese very poorly now. Then, now I'm pretty, I'm bilingual. But at the time, uh, my Portuguese was very rudimentary. And I explained the project to her. And she said, well, send the, send the book to me. So I sent it to book to her. To make a long story short, after three months, she hadn't replied. So I called her up and she said, well, why don't you come to Lisbon? I was living in Porto at the time, which is about 200 miles north, 300 kilometers north. So I went to Lisbon. And the first thing that she asked me was, what would you like to see on the cover? Now, we were speaking Portuguese, so I was just totally shocked. And I said, I don't understand. And she said, well, is there an image, an idea you have for the cover of your book? And I said, well, does that mean you want to publish it? And she said, yes, we loved it. I don't remember anything else about the rest of our conversation because I was in my seventh heaven there. The book was finally going to get published. Um, now, happily, The Last Cabal of Lisbon was translated and came out in April of 1996 and was a huge hit. It was number one bestseller here two weeks after it was published. So that was kind of amazing after getting turned down by 24 American publishers. But I don't really wanna talk about the success of the book. I wanna talk about what it taught me, which is that I love to write about people who've been systematically silenced and persecuted and canceled from history. It gives me great pleasure to do so. So, and in many cases, like the Portuguese New Christians, they're no longer around to tell their own story. So it has to be someone like me or some other historian or writer who's going to tell their story. 
And obviously, I tried to do this as faithfully and truthfully as possible. In fact, the last Kabbalist Lisbon sticks very close to the timeline of the Lisbon massacre of 1506. Now, um, and so said another way, the people who win the elections, the people who win the wars, the prime ministers and the presidents and the dictators of the world, they don't need me. They don't need me at all because they have hundreds of propagandists who are gonna tell story, history from their point of view. Um, you can be sure that Russian history books, for instance, will tell the story that Vladimir Putin was a very righteous leader to start this war in the Ukraine and that he was completely correct to do so. To make this even clearer, imagine if Hitler had won World War II. Imagine what the German school books and history books would say about that glorious cause of eliminating Jews and eliminating their culture from Europe. Um, so no, the leaders of the world, they don't need me. The people who need me are the outsiders, those whose voices who have been stolen, and those who've been eliminated from official histories. So in the case of the last cabals of Lisbon, I explore the dramatic and tragic moment, a tragic moment in Portuguese history for the new Christians and the Jews. And in other books, I've done the same for other people. For instance, in The Seventh Gate, I write about a crime against humanity that even today people don't want to talk about, which is the Nazi war on disabled people. Right away in 1933, Hitler started to sterilize blind people and deaf people, autistic people, people with epilepsy, people with facial deformations. 250,000 of them were murdered in a special program called T4 program, which is named after the Tear Garden. Tear Garden 4 was its address. And even today, people don't want to speak about this. I went to Sweden to talk about the Swedish edition of the book, and no one would interview me. No one would write about the book because up until the 1960s, people considered unhygienic in Sweden were also sterilized. So there, this is a taboo that's still with us, unfortunately. The book that got me in most trouble, the only one that got me hate mail was Guardian of the Dawn, which is about in 1560, the Portuguese exported its inquisition and we can talk more about what the Inquisition was for. They exported their Inquisition to Goa, their co biggest colony in India. And for the next 260 years, the Goa Inquisition persecuted converted Hindus, Hindus forced to convert to Christianity, as well as a small community of Jews forced to convert to Christianity. Tens of thousands of people were put in prison. Thousands of people were burnt at the stake. Now, when I wrote this book, I got hate mail from Goa because the, just like there are very sick people who deny the existence of the Holocaust, there are very sick people who deny the existence of the Inquisition in Goa. And they sent me some hate mail. Then I wrote a book called The Warsaw Anagrams because I was very interested in daily life in the Warsaw Ghetto and in the ghettos created by the Germans. I knew a lot about the camps because like many of you, I'd read Primo Levi and I'd read a great many other writers about the camps, wonderful, wonderful writers, but I didn't know anything about daily life in the ghetto. Did they have schools? Did they have jobs? How did they get extra food? And so I did a lot of research for that and came up with the Warsaw anagrams. And one of my proudest moments was to get four emails from survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto thanking me for this book. That doesn't get any better than that, I think. Um, I wrote a book called The Night Watchman set in contemporary Portugal uh, about abuse, about child abuse and its effects. It's, it's, it's actually a crime story, a mystery, but it has to do with abuse because that's, a, that's been a huge taboo in Portugal. That's only now, being spoken about for the first time, the scandals within the church, the scandals in orphanages. And I thought kids have had their voice stolen too, abused kids. Um, and in Hunting Midnight, another, this is one of my favorites, um, I write about the sand, the Bushmen in South Africa, 
who comes to live in Porto with a Jewish family. Um, because I discovered that the sand, the Bushmen were being decimated in Southern Africa and their culture was disappearing. And if you know anything about them, you realize that they have one of the oldest cultures on earth. Their stories, their myths, they're the first stories told by human beings. It's like Adam and Eve were probably Bushmen. <laughs> and so I had to do something to try to say, to preserve something about their culture and their stories. And so I wrote this novel. Um, <clears throat> my new novel, The Incandescent Threads. It's a very Sephardic book. A lot of the characters have Sephardic heritage. And in part, I want, it's about two Holocaust survivors, two wonderful, charismatic, beautiful cousins named Betty and, Sh Betty and Shelley Zarko. I should say that I've written five books about different branches and generations of the Zarko family that I started with the Les Cabalas de Lisbon, and this is number five. And it's about their lives after the camps. I don't write about Auschwitz or anything. It's about how they remade their lives and how in particular they went on despite their survivor's guilt and how the deep effect that they had on their wives and their kids and their friends. And I just wanna read one excerpt, brief excerpt from that book and then open it up to questions and comments because I've already spoken about 22 minutes. So I'm just gonna read a brief excerpt from the book One of the main characters in the novel, Benny Zarko, is saved by a Christian piano teacher in Poland. And in this scene, as an old lady, she has just died. And I'm sorry, Richard, you seem to have uh, frozen. We'll just give him a minute or so to uh, to return to us. Richard is is speaking to us from sort of the sort of quite a remote part of Portugal, so the uh, the internet there may be a bit uh, unfortunate. I think we have lost him, so we will uh, let him um, sign in again, come back to us. Tom, is there anything we can uh, tell people whilst we must we wait? I'll send them a message and so mail. I think his uh, connection broke down and he will return. Yes. Bruce, Bruce, you have your hand up. Do you want to sing or? Well, <laughs> with um, the Creative Commons that we are, uh, I, I thought it would be great to hear how his impressions, as, as some in the chat have said, of life for the Portuguese Jews of whatever vintage they were called has matured from the earliest time. I mean, I, I think he, he's written so much from different vantage points. It'd be great to, to hear how his own view and living there obviously has, has changed as, a, as the Brooklyn boy or whatever New York boy he, he was. Yes. We just... I sent my message. This goes back to our early days when we used to lose ourselves and our speakers and uh, yeah. <laughs> everybody else. But uh, what life with a haze modem, David? Well, I think he's on the border. It worked fine until just a moment ago. Somebody's asking, uh, so David's asking whether we've uh, ever considered inviting a representative of the Portuguese government to speak to us. Uh, yes, 
Uh, yes, we have. Um, they are um, not good at responding to emails, and I think we're not sort of the audience that they wish to um, address, generally speaking. Um, there was actually something, I think, yesterday in the Portuguese media that the, uh, the police are um, developing their inquiries into uh, what was happening at the uh, Jewish community of Porto, uh, but of course are not, uh, not speaking to the uh, Sephardic genealogical community who could probably um, give them a number of leads. Um, I hope he is going to return. Um, I have not received any email. Tom, do we have his phone number or are we not that well organized? He does have ours. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, okay, no, not yet. If it doesn't work out, we will invite them back in for next week. Indeed. Um, other people are joining. But, um, Bernard, do you have your hand yeah, up? Uh, um, it's something that uh, I was intending to ask him based on how he started. And it is on Thursday evening, I went to the weekly meeting of the Ise Farad group from Buenos Aires. And when Richard's talking about um, New York and the lack of um, historical knowledge. It was a fascinating talk about Emma Lazarus, the poet whose poem appears on the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. But it was by a couple in Spain who have just published a book about her and her work, but in particular, her work in rediscovering, promoting, and supporting the Sephardic community. Um, and this would have been uh, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. She's very well known in the States as a poet and as a, um, as a political journalist, an activist, and a fighter for the rights of in particular refugees, minorities, and um, of Jews. And um, I think that it sort of ties in with um, Richard's wish to get the community of, uh, of Lisbon and the story of Sephardic Jews known around the world and um, I've sent them a message asking if they could give a talk in English because this was in Spanish and they are working to get their book translated into Portuguese and possibly Ladino, but they hadn't thought about doing it in English because there were a lot of books in English already. Yeah. So I th throw that in um, just as something that I was going to raise with him um, about his knowledge of her and how he feels his work ties in with her, but also because it was a fascinating talk, brilliantly given, but I don't know whether they can do it in English. Um, but it's something that I thought might be of interest to other people here. I see that uh, Richard has returned. Oh, okay, okay. Um, oh, as uh, Alexandre. Welcome, welcome her back. Can you unmute yourself, Richard? He is, he is. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm, I'm back. I'm back, I'm sorry. The, the, the Wi-Fi went down here. Uh, 
Yeah, it throws us back to the old days when Zoom wasn't uh, very reliable. But yeah. uh, <laughs> I apologize. Meet me while some people have uh, uh, thrown in their uh, five cents. And um, we can uh, now uh, resume uh, <clears throat> your uh, question and answers. Oh, I, th I think I think you were just about to re read a section from your yeah, book. Yeah, I, I, I can read. I can make it even briefer if, if that's okay. Oh, you, you whatever you like. You're welcome. Okay, so I'm just going to read it briefly. Ava's funeral was held on October 26th at a Jewish cemetery on Long Island, which seemed odd to me because she'd always worn a tiny silver cross around her neck, and I had assumed she had converted to Catholicism probably when she'd understood that, that the Nazis were about to occupy Poland. No, Eva wasn't a Catholic or a Jew or anything else, Benny told me as we trudged across the cemetery to the grave. It had showered the evening before and the walkways were muddy. She had no interest in religion or even mysticism. He gave a little laugh. She thought I was nuts for reading about reincarnation. And the cross I asked, and he said, it was a gift from her mother. So I asked if her mother was Catholic. And he replied, yes, but Eva only believed in Bach and Handel and Mozart and what they could teach us. And what can they teach us, I asked. He stopped walking and looked down, examining the mud on his shoes. At length, he said, to be very gentle with one another because we break very easily. I believe that conclusion said more about Benny and the Nazis than Bach or Handel or Mozart, of course, but I accepted it as an important lesson to learn from whatever source we could. Benny had organized a graveside ceremony and his cousin Shelley and his wife, Julie, had flown down from Montreal and driven out to the cemetery in a rental car. After the gaunt young rabbi that Shelley had hired had told us about the selfless love of grandparents, Benny picked up the shovel the cemetery had provided and sprinkled dirt onto the grave, but he didn't return to me afterward. Instead, he stood by himself, letting his shadow fall over the grave as if that were how he would try to protect Eva now. Something about his rigid stance and closed eyes, I grew terrified that her death had ended our chance for a life together. Right then and there, while studying Benny's purposeful shadow, I knew I would marry him. That is, if he'd accept a somewhat crazy and conflicted young woman as his wife. After Shelley and Julie had shoveled dirt in the casket, it was my dad's turn, and he spoke a Sephardic prayer for the peace of Eva's soul before finally it was my turn. After I sprinkled dirt on Eva's casket with my hand, I'd wanted to grip the earth as hard as I could before letting it go. I started to sing. I hadn't planned to, I just did. And what came out of me was a lullaby that my father taught me. Durme, durme, querida jijica. Durme sin ansia y dolor. Cerra tus lindos ojicos. Durme, durme con sabor. Cerra tus lindos ojicos. Durme, durme con sabor. If you want the English translation, I can give you that, but perhaps some of you understood my bad, my bad Ladino. Can, can I ask a question or, yeah. or, or do you want to continue? Because um, we're, most, most of us in, in, in our core group are sort of Western Sephardic, Portuguese Sephardic, yeah. uh, and you're, reading in, in uh, Judeo-Spanish, and obviously there was, you know, a, a Portuguese element uh, within that community in the Ottoman Absolutely. Empire. But um, I just sometimes feel that, 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 that we, we're, we're the sort of the orphan, uh, the orphan children, that we're, we're forgotten. I mean, we, we don't have, you know, people bashing tambourines or, 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 or nice sort of barracas and things for people to eat. And I, I, I just wonder in, in Portugal generally, when the, the, the yeah, sorry, so I'm not, I'm not actually sure quite, quite what question there is in there, it, 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 ex, ex, except that perhaps when people are thinking about Sephardic, it's it's kind of not not us. It's right. it's 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 somebody else. And I just wondered what you, well, you thought about that, or if it's changing. That's one of my big battles. Um, you know, uh, even people in the Sephardic world and in the Ashkenazi world, they tend to think that Spanish Jewish history is the same as Portuguese Jewish history, and it's not. For yeah. instance, I gave you one example, which was 
you know, the Jews were truly kicked out of Spain in 1492. They were. In Portugal, people talk about the expulsion all the time, but they were never really expelled. They were converted en masse. Virtually all of the Portuguese Jews, I'm talking 99.9%, were converted and made into new Christians. They weren't expelled. There was an edict of expulsion, but it was never carried out. The king decided to convert them instead. That's just one example. Um, there's a great many falsehoods told about the Portuguese Jews, unfortunately. For instance, I'll give you another one that irritates me no end, which was they say, well, you know, all the Jews in Portugal were, came from Spain when they were kicked out of, of, of uh, Spain in 1492. It's completely crazy. There have been Jews living in Portugal since Roman times. They spoke Portuguese. They ate Portuguese food. They were Portuguese. They traded with their Portuguese neighbors. They lived in Lisbon, in Porto, in Castelo de Vida, in Braga, in Faro, in Guimarães. They lived everywhere in Portugal. We know this from the historical documents of all these towns. Yes, Spanish Jews came over the border in 1492 to Portugal, but only the richest ones were allowed to stay. And there were very few rich ones. Why? Because Spain had become a buyer's market overnight. The, port the, the Spanish Jews had to leave. So selling a house might get them a donkey. They had no money. So they all left Portugal. The king gave them eight months or he would turn them into slaves. And they knew that this would happen because when some of them stayed, he took their children away. He took 2000 Spanish Jewish children away and sent them to the uninhabited African island of San Tome where almost all of them died within a few years. We know that too from reports from San Tome. So there's all these crazy ideas of mixing Spanish and Portuguese Jewish history, and you can't do it. They are separate to some extent. So my, I mean, my, my, my understanding, and obviously Ton and others can, can correct me, is that by the end of 1492, most of the Jews within Portugal had come from Spain, uh, and and certainly what we we tend to see in 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 our own genealogical research is there is this sort of heartland, sort of stretching down from so sort of, Trazas Montes to sort of Fundão and Castela Branco and so forth. Uh, and again, my my rather simplistic understanding or, or not understanding but assumption is that people just sort of cross the border and sort of slump down where they uh, where they arrived, and um, then later you know. It became was, absorbed into the Portuguese. I talk, talk, right. Ton, is it, that, is that didn't right? Happen. That, that didn't happen. There were Portuguese Jews living here for centuries. They lived. And there's no, 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 nobody, nobody questions that. I'm, ah. I'm just. My, my, my question is, is statistical. Um, ah. statistical and I cannot say, but yeah. There were many families with branches on both sides of the border. That is true in places. Oh, for like sure, that. for sure. I mean, my own family is a typical absolutely. example of that, yeah. That's absolutely true. But as I say, unless they had enough money to stay, they were, they were forced to leave by the Portuguese king. They could not stay. So the very few Spanish Jews ended up staying in Portugal. 30, for instance, 30 wealthy Jew, Jew, Spanish Jews were permitted to stay in Porto. They were the exception including the last chief rabbi of Castile, Rabbi Isaac Abouab, lived on the Rua de San Bento de Vitoria in Porto. That is true. And so those 30 families were there, but all the others had to leave. They left. Tom? Well, um, what I read is from uh, Henry Kamen, and he said that in 1492, uh, there were maybe 100,000 Jews left in Spain, and most of them went east or south to North Africa. Uh, but the large portion also went to Portugal. And the fi figure he gives is about 30,000. So where could we go to, uh, to find the real numbers? Well, it, it may be 30,000, but as I, as I say, the king would not allow them to stay here without paying it a high tax. Mm -hmm. And so those people then would go on to Istanbul and Salonika and North Africa and anywhere they could. 
And if you just read the story of the 2000 Spanish Jewish children who were taken from their parents and sent to San Tome, mm -hmm. because that was the king's way of telling these Spanish Jews, you cannot stay in my kingdom. You cannot stay here. Yes. Um, <clears throat> you, um, you, 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 you talked about, I mean, it's really interesting for somebody to, from, from the outside to, to, to look in at, uh, in at us. Um, okay. Oh, Kevin is saying you're, you're correct. Um, you just can't remember the figures. Okay. Well, Ke Kevin, Kevin probably knows. Um, that, um, it, it, it's funny because I think you're looking at one period of the history yeah. and we tend to look at another period of the history. Okay. It, it, it is like for me, I mean, my, my family's prehistory, we would consider really to be Amsterdam. And then, yeah. you know, we came to London from, from Amsterdam wow. and the, 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 the period in Portugal and, and Spain is kind of prehistory. Wow. And rather than perhaps seeing ourselves as, as, as victims, we, you know, we have quite a lot, a number of talks on Sephardim and the slave trade and and and, and stuff like right. like that uh, and it, it's it's kind of perhaps we can go on a bit later to discuss the uh the the the, the portuguese nationality law yeah. um because it just seems to me that there's a big misunderstanding um going on uh between between different communities i mean first of all perhaps in portugal they didn't actually know who we were uh, I, I mean you know their, their laws contain their, their, their law contained kind of errors um, and then they sort of entrusted I mean yeah perhaps we, we could go there there now I mean what 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 do you think their goal was in in passing this nationality law well that's a good question um, for years let me just say that before this passed, I had had the good fortune to meet a couple of politicians who were important here and friendly toward the Jews, like Mario Suarez, the former president and prime minister. And I spoke to Mario Suarez about perhaps, not this law, I didn't say anything specific, but some way of compensating the Portuguese Jews who were converted and then massacred and then persecuted by the Inquisition from 1536 into the beginning of the 19th century. And the way that the Portuguese government decided to do that was this law. In my opinion, the law was extremely faulty because it gave too much power to the synagogues to evaluate whether or not the candidates had enough Sephardic or Portuguese Jewish background to qualify for nationality. And I mentioned that not to blame anyone, not to, you know, but when a lot of money is involved, and so the Porto Sinagog, I believe, was charging 250 euros to evaluate your candidacy. When a lot of, and thousands of people were applying, that's another thing, the Portuguese government didn't realize how many thousands of people would be applying. So when a lot of money is involved, let's just say very neutrally, it tends to attract a, some strange people and it tends to attract some strange behavior. My idea right away was to have a government board with historians, with genealogists, with people who know what they're doing, who would evaluate these candidacies. That didn't happen and we know the result. Yes, I, I, I think if, if, if anything, the, these laws in Spain and Portugal have probably hastened the uh, the death of the uh, the Sephardim as as um, we, our community has rather been sort of pushed aside by uh, others making substantial sums of money um, and yeah there, nobody nobody seems to be interested in the preservation of the, uh, the well, Western Sephardic culture. Well, <laughs> okay, very... okay, yes, uh, no, 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 nobody with uh, nobody with with power. Uh, with power. Yeah. Um, well. I, uh, to, to be to be fair to the government, I don't think they had any idea what they were getting into. They thought maybe there'd be a few thousand applications. They didn't understand there'd be 50,000 people applying. They didn't understand the money involved. I'm not, I'm not necessarily forgiving them, but 
it was just ignorance, complete ignorance. Yeah, I, I, I think a lot of naivety. Um, Car Carrie, you have your hand up. Do you want to unmute? Uh, yes, uh, I was curious about my question of what is taught in Portugal about, okay. uh, you said you wrote your first book because yeah. you wanted to speak for people who are not spoken about, who are right. erased from history. Are right. they still erased from history? Is Portuguese Jewish history taught in the schools? Um, it's taught a little bit. It's become a little better. People still don't understand what a Jew is, I have to say. Um, you know, the, you have to understand here that being a Jew, even researching your background was taboo here for nearly 300 years because of the Inquisition. You could not speak in public about your beliefs, your family, your ancestors. It was completely silenced. And so when the dictatorship fell, when we had the revolution in uh, 1974, for the first time in literally 450 years, people could speak about their ancestors and they did. And that's why my book was such a big hit here. It, it, it touched a curiosity. I'm happy to, another one of the things I'm most proud of is there's a monument now in front of the St. Dominic's church where the pogrom broke out, a monument to the 2000 murdered new Christians. And the people of City Hall have told me a number of times that without my novel, that never would have been there. There would be no monument. Mm -hmm. So my struggle is daily. My struggle is daily through the books to teach people about Portuguese Jewish history. There, there's a, so many misconceptions here. They think the Portuguese Jews spoke Hebrew at home. They didn't speak Hebrew at home. They spoke Portuguese at home. Th they think that the Portuguese Jews were all wealthy. What is the number one profession of new Christians in a town like Belmont? Belmont is extremely well studied in the Northeast of Portugal because it had a big crypto Jewish community. What's the number one profession? Shoemaker, shoemaker. They weren't rich. Yes, there was an elite in Lisbon of astronomers and surgeons and scientists and doctors, but in the rest of the country, they were shoemakers and saddle makers and vintners. You know, they did everything that the Christians did and they lived beside the Christians in peace. And so it's a little better. My books are making an inroad. Some other people's books are making an inroad, but there's still a huge, huge gap of ignorance here simply about what is a Jew. But if, um, if I can ask, I mean, for example, with the monument in uh, Lisbon, and it's, yeah. it's wonderful that they put it there, but yeah. it's a big Ashkenazi star of David, <laughs> uh, which was never a, a Sephardic symbol. No. And again, somebody on, on YouTube is, is, is talking about going to uh, a festival uh, of, of Sephardic music in, in Kashkais. But I'm wow. assuming a festival of is, is sort of Ottomans and somebody sort of bashing a tambourine and screeching out Maranika. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, me Corazon and all of, all of this stuff, which is, again, it, it's not really okay. the well, Portuguese the Sephardic. Yeah, sorry. You have to understand here, um, again, I'm, I'm trying to be very diplomatic. The Jewish communities in Portugal, Lisbon and Porto primarily, were extremely closed communities. Yeah. They're a little bit more open now, but not very much. I've had, I had some disagreeable experiences there when I first came. Okay, so they're closed communities. They decide that they want to participate in putting up a monument. Well, a lot of the members of the community in Lisbon are Ashkenazi. And it just so happens that the person who gave the money to build the monument is an Ashkenazi Jew who decided who would, who would design it. And so you, you find that people aren't consulted. Uh, you know, people, nobody consulted me, of course, and I'm not the world's biggest expert, but they could have consulted, you know, experts in Sephardic iconography or whatever you want to call it, Sephardic history, Sephardic traditions, the menorah, et cetera. But that just doesn't happen because the way the communities are structured are so insular. They're so inward looking. The, the communities here aren't like the ones 
in either England or America or Brazil, which in my experience are extremely open. They're not like that. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the expression Ashkin normativity, um, which, which is essentially um, treating sort of Ashkenazi Judaism as wow. sort of normative Judaism. And of course in wow. Israel, trying to impose that on, on Sephardic communities. Um, which was actually one of the reasons why I, I, I was quite enthusiastic about the uh, the nationality laws in Spain and Portugal, because I thought yeah. maybe that would give us some alternative, but um, not, <laughs> I think. Well, in, in part, it's a demographic problem, because in a place like the United States, I don't know the statistics, but I would su suppose that 95% of the Jews in America yeah. are Ashkenazi. And so you have this huge demographic number of Ashkenazi Jews and the Sephardim tend to tend to vanish within that. Yeah, I think we're, we're sort of light entertainment, but um, uh, Bernard, Bernard, Bernard do, you, do you want to unmute? You have a, a question. Yeah, first of all, can I thank you for your talk? Secondly, can I thank you for your books. I have only read The Last Kabbalist of Lisbon, but I wanted to ask you about how you did the research on that. And in particular, because I couldn't read it in one go. Right. Um, it is in many places so painful, the experiences wow. that, that you're describing. But the degree of detail that you give about how people were living, um, the conditions in which they lived, the things that they were doing and things that were done to them, um, I could immediately identify with, which is why it was so hard to read them. Sure. And when, um, if you could answer that, I then have another question, if okay. I may. Yeah. But, um, how did I do the research? Well, unfortunately, oh, well, first of all, thank you for your very kind words about the book. And thank you for having such a beautiful, I think it's magnolia tree behind you or something. Um, it's my family tree. Okay, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, unfortunately, there was no one book about day, Jewish, no, daily life in Lisbon in the 15th. Or, there's no book sure. like that. So I was, I had to read everything I could find. I read books, I read cookbooks, uh, I read books about the, the structure of Lisbon, where the churches were, what the main churches were. I visited Lisbon many times to see where my family lived and to see what they could see from their houses. Could they see uh, the Moorish castle? Could they see the river? You know, so I, I walked the city a lot. Um, I found, I read everything about Kabbalah I could find because the family were Kabbalists and manuscript illuminators. I've, I managed to find a, a document of recipes for creating the colors in manuscript illumination, which was fabulous. And it was Portuguese. So it took me an entire year. Um, and I collected a gigantic pile of notes, most of which I couldn't use because I wasn't writing an encyclopedia. Um, and then the detail comes out of that, comes out of the research. Happily, I have an extremely good memory. So I was able to, you know, sometimes it's a trick. If you talk about the smell of olive oil and yeast on the street, if you talk about the sound of Portuguese, if you talk about if it's spring and you smell certain kind of flowers, the reader is convinced this, this author knows what he's talking about. And so that's what I tried to do throughout the entire book. Um, and I love doing it. I mean, the, the painful part, I think, has to do with, it's a very violent book, but it was a very violent time, you know? And so I felt to be, to be fair to the 2000 new Christians who were murdered and burnt in the main square, it had to be violent. I, I, I couldn't not do that. Thank you. Uh, you um, also the, use, uh, oh, sorry. You had another question, Bernard. Yeah, I, I do. Uh, but I, I also wanted to say um, that, um, and this, this is kind of personal, but um, my, one of my many 15th great-grandfathers was Alvaro Rodriguez of Rua San Miguel, uh, San Miguel in Porto. Um, I know Rua San Miguel. Yeah. And when I was reading your book, 
I had to keep stopping to look things up, to yeah. look up names, to look up places, yeah. to check relationships. And I really love books that make me do that. Oh, good. Um, but I have a completely separate question. I already discussed it while you were getting your internet connection back. On yeah. Thursday evening, I went to a Zoom talk run by the Ise Farad group, who do a weekly Spanish Zoom meeting from Buenos Aires. Oh, and this Thursday, it was a couple um, who were in Madrid who have just published a book about the life and work of Emma Lazarus. And when you were talking about people with unknown histories and about fighting for people whose um, fights are not known, I was surprised when they started saying the extent to which she is a woman who was known as a poet, as a political journalist, as a fighter for rights, particularly the rights of refugees, I was surprised um, at how much of her work was devoted to getting the story of her families and other people's families, Sephardic past known within the US. Yeah. And um, I wondered whether or not, I, I of course see that you're aware of her, but I wondered whether you see um, the work that she was doing as parallel to what you're doing, because I think it's very important. And one very last, again, personal yeah. point. Um, a whole lot of my ancestors turned out to be new Christians who went to Goa and were part of the persecution. And they were on both sides. Um, you know, Absolutely. they were persecuting and they were persecuted. And um, so I haven't read your book yet about Goa, but believe me, I'm going to. Okay. Um, there'll be a new edition next year. It's it's a bit out of print now. So, but, okay. Yeah, um, I mean, um, let, let me take up that third point first. You know, the people were converted and many of them became faithful Catholics. And so the nationality law, in my opinion, also has to take that into account, that are we compensating what happened four and 500 years ago, in which case Catholics, believing Catholics should be eligible for Portuguese nationality if they can prove they had Portuguese Jewish background, because otherwise you're not compensating the people who were persecuted. Anyway, it's, it's a, maybe it's a small point, but um, yes, there were people who, who, who became very faithful Catholics and who even became, uh, rose up inside the Inquisition, unfortunately, yeah. uh, which became a problem for the Catholic authorities because there were new Christians rising into positions of power. Um, I'm not aware of Emma Lazarus's work uh, with Sephardic history and culture. I probably should should read something about that. And thank you for letting me know. I've taken a note here. Uh, before we go to David's question, there was a quick question from uh, Kevin. How how did the King uh, of Portugal react to the Lisbon massacre? Um, he was away from the city when it happened. He was in a city called Abrantes, and um, what he did was. He sent the troops in, but only after three days of massacre. This The massacre lasted three days. Okay, so he sent the troops in to reestablish order, and he later arrested two of the Dominican priests responsible for going throughout the city, crying death to the Jews, death to the heretics. He had them arrested, and he had them executed. And that was basically it. There, were, there was, that was it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David, you have a question. Yes. Uh, good morning, actually. Aloha from uh, Hawaii. Aloha. Um, yeah. Um, so a question I had in the chat was related to, I guess, your experience living in Portugal now, as, as sure. a, even if you're a secular Jew, and yeah. it's what is the environment there in, uh, in terms of being Jewish in Portugal? What's the level of uh, that you perceive relative to anti-Semitism or towards right. anti-Zionism. Right. And as I recall, Portugal was very late to the game in, in uh, even recognizing the state of Israel. Right. Um, so I'm just curious because every, when I was there, everything seemed to be erased. There was almost nothing like, except for that monument you had in front of the, right. the church. Yeah, you have to look pretty hard to find traces of Portuguese Jewish history. But um, 
but that was a conscious effort of, on the part of the Inquisition. So you, you can understand that silence is the main result. Um, there's no visceral anti-Semitism here as you might find in places like Poland and Hungary where there are still uh, stereotypical portrayals of Jews and where the church might even foment hatred of the Jews. Uh, the Jew, the anti-Semitism here has more to do with stereotypes, that Jews are cheap, the Jews are aggressive, that sort of thing, you know, that Jews have big noses. Occasionally people will say things like that to me, semi-humorously. Um, I tend not to react very well to that, um, but that's what happens. Actually, there's probably more curiosity here positively, because as I said, it was taboo for hundreds of years here to talk about any suspicion you had that you had Portuguese Jewish ancestors. And so after the revolution, you could come out of the closet. You could talk about that. You could ask about that. You could research your own family tree. And a lot of people do that. A lot of people ask me for help in doing research. Um, and so there's a huge amount of curiosity here, which I think is positive about the Jewish history of their own country of Portugal. Of course, you do get people on the left side of the spectrum, some, not that many, who are unable to distinguish between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Uh, occasionally, I have to deal with that. Uh, I do the best I can. Um, but most people here are intelligent enough to understand, for instance, that I'm not a representative of Israel. I have nothing to do with the government of Israel. And to talk to me about that aspect, it, it, it makes no sense. So I think Portugal is probably a very good place to be Jewish. Um, but as I said, the two, there's three communities, uh, Lisbon, Porto, and Belmont. And in my opinion, they're, they're very closed. I do have some friends there, but for instance, if you want to visit there, you have to take a picture of your passport and send it to them and make an official request that you want to visit the synagogue. It's, it's not like America where you just show up at Temple Beth Shalom and say, you know, I'd like to participate in the Sabbath service. It's not like that. It's, very, it's, it's quite closed. I, I, I should add, there seems to be a, a small community forming in Albufeira in the uh -huh. um, Algarve. Um, can, can, can I ask, what's the reaction in Portugal to what's happened with uh, the Jewish community of Porto? Well, I think the Lisbon synagogue has distanced itself officially. Just yes, they have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, but by generally people generally, in Portugal. Well, um, there's a suspicion, I would say, amongst people. Well, look, most people you know, 90% of the people wouldn't even know about what happened except for what came on the news, which is that they gave Roman Abramovich uh, nationality after three months. So most people would in Portugal are very, how can I put this? They're very skeptical. They're very um, suspicious that there's always some corruption going on, no matter what it is. And so I think probably people would say there's probably some corruption going on. Um, people who do know about the Porto community um, probably feel like me that it was a big mistake to make the synagogues the gatekeepers in terms of who could and who could not get nationality. Um, and so it's not a good situation um, and it was never going to be a good situation. I, I I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball, but I was, I could have predicted something bad. Do you have any thoughts about how there could be a proper cultural engagement between uh, the Sephardic world and, and Portugal? Because it seems to me what we have at the moment are, as you say, a couple of communities that are quite uh, insular. There's a uh, Hudiaria, I think it is in Portuguese, uh, industry who perhaps don't entirely understand who we are right. um, and then lots of well, not lots so various Israeli law firms and others making a, a killing right. um, selling passports um, but I, I, I mean I, I have to say my own personal thought was that perhaps we 
Portugal could engage with us as as effectively being their first diaspora community. Yeah. Um, but in the end, it just seems that there is no no connection between these two groups. I mean, there are academics yeah. uh, in Portugal with whom right. we are, you know, we we are uh, developing relationships, but but official Portugal seems to be a million miles away from us. I just wonder how we might sort of connect well, to them. The only thing I can think of would be to actually send for you or Ton or some representatives to come here and stay a week and meet with some people in parliament. I can help you get in touch with the right people. And, um, and maybe something could come up about that. Uh, I don't think you could, obviously, I don't believe you could work through the synagogues in Porto or Lisbon. That's not going to work. So if you want something like that to happen, I think you would need to send one or two representatives here yeah. and be willing to stay a week and meet with a few people and explain the situation. And, you know, we say in Portuguese, you know, exchange ideas about how you could develop some sort of relationship. And that might work but it would require you actually being here. It's not something that could happen through the internet. It, it, it's, that's not the way Portugal works. Yes. Uh, Bruce, Bruce, do you want to uh, unmute? Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to extend the, that thought, David. Um, in, in the genealogical society's uh, you know, commentary on, on the nationality law, right. this recommendation that there be an effect a use of this issue as a computer science uh, uh, innovation that understanding to get all the data, the data sources that would be recognized by the government for these purposes to gather and then using modern AI and ML um, techniques in a way that the government would recognize would actually, and, and, and true to real genealogical standard, yeah. would actually put the nation at a very different poignancy yeah. in tackling the issue. So, so I think, you know, your offer to speak with government officials, not just as a Jewish issue, but as a technological advance for the nation okay. issue is, is quite poignant and, and, you know, certainly David uh, and Tom can represent the issues you know, quite, quite yeah. well. Well, I, I think they would have to, um, how can I put this? Um, I think you'd have to bring some of the people in the government up to speed in terms of what can be done it, it, with regard to genealogical research, because obviously that's not their specialty. And so you would need to uh, provide them with advice and tools of what could possibly be done in the future if if they keep the program and that's not clear that they're going to keep the program yeah i mean my understanding is the program has functionally uh closed um yes just through the mechanism of 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 we have to prove so inheritance of uh of property that might have been uh, confiscated 400 years ago <laughs> so it's a bit uh, a bit of a um, nonsense yeah, I don't. I haven't. I've I've read the new some of the new regulations. Um, I I don't know. I, I I again, my feeling is that this this could never work unless you have a government board made up of historians and genealogists who are willing to go over and paid to go over each of the candidates because it, it, leaving it with the synagogues just doesn't work. Yes, I, I would actually say, in fairness to to Lisbon Synagogue, that they have um, yeah. hired historians and um, are, are trying to uh, adhere to. Well, not are trying to do seem to be adhering to uh, genealogical yeah. standards. Sometimes, actually, even to the point of pedantry. But um, uh, Ton, I'll just look. Are, are there any more um, questions or comments? I'll just quickly look on. Uh, YouTube. Um, there's sort of questions about DNA, perhaps, which aren't totally, uh, totally relevant to us. Um, somebody, somebody was asking before about um, how much of Jewish history is now taught in Portuguese textbooks. Do you do you know about that? Yeah, very little. Um, 
you know, we had the Inquisition here from 1536 until the early 19th century. And if you ask people how the Inquisition functioned, where it functioned, what its goals were, uh, I would estimate that 95 to 99% of the people don't know. And that's just an example uh, of the level of, I hate to use the word ignorance, but I'm trying to look for another word, the, the, the level of lack of knowledge about the country's own history. And I consider Portuguese Jewish history, Portuguese history. That's another of my battles. It's yes, there's Portuguese Jewish history, but it's the country's history. Yes, yeah, I, I, I think that's fair, um, yeah. Um, Ton, uh, we've, because we this was going to be quite a short meeting, we sort of somewhat overextended. Is, is there any, any more questions or anything anybody um, wants to add? There are a lot of thank yous for your book uh, books, Richard. Thank you. Thank that you. quite a few people in our group uh, have read one or more of your books. <clears throat> uh, I have a question myself, and that's back to uh, the way sure. you research your books. Did you also use Inquisition documents for background? Well, yeah. Not for the last Kabbalist because it was the, the time period is before the Inquisition. It's 1506 and mm -hmm. the Inquisition started 30 years later. So, but in, in other books, um, I have used Inquisitional records. I've just finished a novel that took me four years to write. that's set in a beautiful, beautiful hilltop town in, in Portugal called Castelo Rodrigo. And it's set in the 1670s and 1680s. And so what I did a lot of the information is now digitalized. Anyone, anywhere in the world can get it. And so what I do, it's not that user friendly. So you have to use some time and some strategies to get the information you want. But I was able to find out the names of the people arrested in Castelo Rodrigo, the dates they were arrested, their professions, the names of their parents, the names of their children. And so that is a wonderful tool for me because when this book comes out in England, or America or Portugal, the names are real. The dates they were arrested are real. And I felt that that was very important for telling, again, you know, I'm, I'm committed to telling truthful stories. I, I'm, I, obviously it's fiction, so the main characters are invented, but the context and what happened to people and what they suffered, I'm very committed to telling the truth about that. Uh, speaking of the Inquisition, there was one remark from André. Uh, are you aware of any efforts from the government to recover and scan the rotting trial records from the Evora court? Uh, of the Evora, of the Evora uh, Inquisition? Yes. Um, I was looking, uh, I have to say that for this book, I was looking at the Coimbra Inquisition. Those of you, some of you may know that the Inquisition was based in, in some Portuguese cities and not others. There was the Lisbon Inquisition, the Ever Inquisition, Coimbra Inquisition. Um, for a while there was one in Porto, but it lost its power. Um, so Ever, I'm not, I'm not clear on the situation of whether those documents have been digitalized yet. The Coimbra ones are largely available. Ever, I don't know, I'd have to, I'd have to look. Uh, I can try to look if someone is interested in contacting me. I can try to look and mm -hmm. see if they're there. Yeah. It seems that um, uh, most of these decisions about digitization were taken in Lisbon. Very uh, probably. A centralized view of government. So Lisbon records were first, then Coimbra. And yes. last. And, and as I say, it's not, it's not very user-friendly. For instance, if I enter the words Castelo Rodrigo, everything with the word Castelo comes up, which mm -hmm. makes it totally useless. Yeah. And so um, you have to, you know, if, if I were an artificial intelligence person, I could probably come up with strategies really quickly. It took me a while to figure out how to get the information I wanted. And mm -hmm. So it's not the quickest uh, process in the world, but you can do yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Um, David, I think we are through our questions. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, 
Can I can I first of all just say thank you because it's absolutely uh, fascinating, and we uh, hopefully can involve you in uh, any any initiatives that uh, that we have going forward. And indeed, if you have ideas, um, we're really grateful to to okay, hear well, them because come yeah. to Lisbon and uh, we'll prepare meetings for you. That's the way to do it. That's the only way you're yeah. going to be able to get anywhere. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. But. Thank you. Well, that's it. That's it for today. That's it for today. Uh, we thank our patrons who make all of this possible. We thank our viewers on YouTube, and uh, a big thank you to Richard Zemlow who kept thank us. Thank you, Tone. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, everyone. Please tell your friend, tell everyone you've ever met about the incandescent threats. <laughs> even, even tell your Ashkenazi friend. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. Okay. To see.